Welcome to Spring Creek Church Online. I'm Pastor Jared, and I'm so glad you've joined us today. If you do not know, now you know we've moved our online broadcast to 9.30 a.m. every Sunday morning. Do us a favor and spread the word. Now, grab your Bible, grab your favorite cup of coffee, and let's dig into the word of the Lord. Glad you're joining us today. I'm doing a standalone message today. This is called Positively Single. I am so excited about this message because I just feel like this is a message that is seldom, if ever, heard in church, and it's one we desperately need to hear. Uh, I will be back soon uh, after this message. I'm going to be doing a series called Unfinished Business, where we talk about the healing of our past that so desperately needs to happen. That's going to be a three-part series, so stay tuned for that. As we get started today, let's just begin with prayer. Father, this is your time. These are your people. I believe, God, that you're already at work. I believe, God, with all of my heart that this is the message for this hour, that, that, Lord, we need to be reminded what you have said in your word and not let the force of tradition dictate what we do as a church and how we treat people in the church. So, God, be with us now, move in a mighty way among us, and God, help us to all find the contentment that comes from knowing that we're living in the center of your will. In Christ's name, amen. You know, some people, or single people, that is, have had remarkable impact on history. Leonardo da Vinci was single, as was Michelangelo, Isaac Newton, Beethoven, Thoreau, and even the Wright brothers. Queen Elizabeth of England, she was single. In addition, so were Jane Austen, Helen Keller, and Florence Nightingale. Susan B. Anthony, a pioneer of women's voting rights, she was single. And there are others. Corey Ten Boom, the author of The Hiding Place, brought thousands to Christ. She was single. Maggie Kuhn was the founder of the Grey Panthers. She was often asked how a woman like her never married, and she said, sheer luck. John Stott, a noted theologian and author, was voted one of Time Magazine's 100 most influential people. He's single. Besides those people, the Bible itself is filled with the story of those who never married. People like Elijah, Elisha, and Jeremiah. The New Testament includes apparent singles like John the Baptist, Luke, Silas, Barnabas, Timothy, Titus, and the Apostle Paul. In fact, Aquila and Priscilla are the only married couple ever highlighted in the early church, which has led many people to say that the early church might have looked more like a singles gathering than anything else. And maybe most important of all, the one truly full, complete, and holy life that was ever lived was Jesus Christ, and he was single. So here's my question. If marriage is the divinely ordained way to live, then why wasn't Jesus married? I think it's safe to say that none of these world changers I've just mentioned ever stop for a moment to think of themselves as less than whole simply because they weren't married. Let's face it, not every one of us is going to get married and have 2.1 children. In fact, it's been estimated that one-fifth, 20% of the American adults, will never marry. Statistically speaking, America now, Americans now spend more of their adult years single than they do marry. So get this, in 1960, 72% of U.S. adults were married. But in 2017, the U.S. Census reported 110.6 million unmarried people over the age of 18. So that's 45.2% of the American adult population. So let me just say right up front, churches, as a general rule, have done a poor job of ministering to singles. Because of church tradition, not scripture, but tradition, marrying and having kids is often considered the preferred way of life, and to some even the God-ordained way of life. As a result, singles are often looked upon as second class. You can see this distortion in practically every Christian bookstore you ever go into. Go to the marriage and family section, and you'll find bookcase after bookcase after bookcase, chock full of resources for married folks. Then go to the single section, and you might find a couple of shelves at best. Even though nearly half of the adult population in our country is single, the books and resources churches produce for marriage versus singles is decidedly lopsided. Now, there are some of you here with enough biblical knowledge to know that the New Testament totally endorses being single, and it says it can be a blessing. But I want to suggest to you that it's even more than that. What I've discovered is that God promises those who remain single in Christ blessings even greater than the blessings of marriage and children. 
Now that's something you likely have never heard in church. So I hope that before I'm done, not only will you have a clearer understanding of singleness, but that your new view will impact the way you see yourself if you're single, or if you're married, the way you treat and interact with your single friends. So let's begin with this thought, better blessings in store for you. So I have a longer Bible passage that I would like to, to share with you. It's normal than I, it's longer than I normally cite, but it's worth our time. It's worth reading. The prophet Isaiah makes this bold claim. This is what the Lord says, maintain justice and do what is right. For my salvation is close at hand and my righteousness will soon be revealed. Blessed is the one who does this, the person who holds it fast, who keeps the Sabbath without desecrating it and keeps their hand from doing any evil. Let no foreigner who is bound to the Lord say, the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. And let no eunuch complain, I am only a dry tree. For this is what the Lord says, to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, who choose what pleases me and hold fast to my covenant, to them I will give within my temple and its walls a memorial and a name better than sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that will endure forever. And foreigners who bind themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. That's Isaiah 56, one to seven. Now in the middle of these verses, I, I don't know if you notice, there's a reference to eunuchs. Now, we've talked about eunuchs before. A eunuch is a person who's incapable of producing children. Now, one type of eunuch, of course, is born that way. In other words, biology has rendered their body infertile. The other type were often servants who were made eunuchs against their will. In other words, they were castrated by their masters. This is something that likely happened to the prophet Daniel in the Old Testament because of his proximity to the king's family and the fact that he was placed under the authority of a man whom the Bible describes as being in charge of the eunuchs. In addition, the book that bears his name never mentions him having a wife or kids, unlike Joseph, who did marry and had kids in captivity. So back to this verse. God promises to give eunuchs blessings that are better than sons and daughters. Better not equivalent to, not a consolation prize, but better blessings and a name that will last forever. Now, typically we think of our name as living on through our children and our children's children, right? But God's promises that the eunuch's name will last for all eternity, even without children to carry on their name. Now to understand why God makes this bold, outrageous claim, we have to back up and we've got to get the big picture about this. Think about this. God creates a perfect world. Sin enters that perfect world. Now what is God going to do to bring about redemption in this broken world? How's he going to do that? What God does is raise up a people through whom God himself will enter his creation to redeem it. And who are those people? The Jewish people. So to establish a people, a lineage from Abraham to the coming of Christ, here's the thing you have to remember. God was primarily building his covenant his covenant people through the mechanism of procreation. Does that make sense? If, if your promise is to bring the Messiah through a certain bloodline, then getting married and having kids is an absolutely essential part of that plan because God has to preserve the bloodline at all costs. So the emphasis throughout the entire Old Testament is on the seed of the people of God surviving. That's why, we, that's why uh, when it comes to marriage and kids, it's such a major emphasis of the Old Testament. When Abraham was chosen as the father of the Jewish nation, God took him out and he showed him all the stars in the sky at night. And he said, so shall your offspring be. Then when Abraham couldn't have a son because of Sarah's infertility, Abraham has a child through his servant. And he says about that son, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God answers unequivocally, no, Sarah, your wife, will bear you a son. In other words, the direct physical offspring mattered. The son would come through Abraham's seed and through his wife, Sarah, just as God had promised. Years later, God reaffirms the same promise to Abraham's son, Isaac. He says, I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and to your offspring, I will give all these lands and I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham, your father. 
Again, physical offspring are crucial in this covenant because a person's name and lineage would end without having kids. Then along come David and Saul. Once again, to emphasize how important having kids was, listen to what Saul begged David to swear not to do. He said, Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, that you will not cut up my offspring after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. So you see this a lot in the Old Testament. It's all about getting married and having babies. This also explains some very odd practices in the Old Testament, like leveret marriage. Leveret marriage was a law that said if your married brother died before producing offspring, you were legally obligated to take his widow as a second wife in order to have children so that the name of the deceased brother would not be lost. Everything in the Old Testament is about preserving the seed. Now, I know I've just pulled out a few isolated verses to show you this, but literally there's dozens and dozens of verses like this that make the same point. So in light of the fact that having kids and preserving the seed was of supreme importance, what Isaiah said in Isaiah 56, 5 sticks out like a sore thumb, that eunuchs, those who are unmarried and incapable of producing children, would receive greater blessings than sons and daughters and would also see their name established forever. How is that statement even possible in the Old Testament? Where does this amazing promise come from? What's it pointing toward? Well, all you have to do is look back a couple of chapters to Isaiah chapter 53. Here we find the prophecies of the coming Messiah who will deliver humanity once and for all from sin. And the Bible says this, he was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Now, we all know that's referring to Jesus. That's what Isaiah 53 is all about. It's describing who Messiah is and what Messiah will do. But in the midst of this description of Messiah, there's a statement that's made that often gets overlooked. Let me show it to you. It was the will of the Lord to crush him. He, was, he has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It's that phrase, he shall see his offspring. So so get this, Isaiah is telling us that once the Messiah dies as an offering for guilt and rises again to prolong his days, he will be that, through that great saving act, he will produce many children. He will see his offspring. So how did Jesus produce offspring if he never married? What this verse is telling us is that the new people of God that are formed by Jesus Christ will not be formed by physical procreation, but by what Jesus accomplished in his death and resurrection by a spiritual birth. Can you see that? It's now faith that forms the people of God, not their lineage, not their bloodline, not their birth. Jesus produces offspring through the new birth. Which is why the next chapter, Isaiah 54, begins, Sing, O barren one, who did not bear, bring forth into, break forth into singing and cry out loud, you who have not been in labor, for the children of the desolate one will be more than the children of her who is married, says the Lord. God raises up kids through the new birth. So when the New Testament comes around, Jesus makes clear that his people, the true people of God, are produced not by physical procreation, but by spiritual regeneration. I mean, isn't that exactly what Jesus said to Nicodemus? Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Paul says the same thing in Galatians 3 to Jews and Gentiles alike. Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. In Christ Jesus, you're all sons of God through faith. In other words, it's a brand new deal. We're no longer the physical descendants of Father Abraham. That's not what makes you part of the covenant people of God. It's your faith in Jesus Christ that does that. This is a really big picture idea all of us desperately need to put marriage and kids and singleness in perspective. Given this new reality, single people in Christ are not at a disadvantage whatsoever for not being married or having children, and may actually in some ways have a greater advantage. The Apostle Paul was single, and he said of his converts, Though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. 
Paul was a father. He was a dad, even though he never married or had kids, because he had many kids in Christ. Not by marrying and fathering children, but by leading people into the new birth. What I'm saying is the New Testament gives us a radical relational reordering. Now hear me on this. I'm not sentimentalizing singleness to make unmarried people feel better about themselves. I'm telling you that the overwhelming big picture idea in the Bible declares that marriage is temporary and secondary over against the eternal and primary nature of the church. Certainly, there is no question at all that marriage is temporary because that's what Jesus taught us. He said in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. Jesus taught us that marriage belongs to this life, not to the next. So don't become too engrossed by it. Romance and marriage are earthbound types of relationships. Bottom line, you came into this world single and you will go out single because your marriage ends the moment you die. All of us will spend eternity as singles. Basically, the Bible is telling us if you don't like being single, eternity is going to be rough. <laughs> so think about that in light of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. Now, that's the verse you don't hear quoted a lot at weddings, but ask any widow, and they'll tell you exactly what that verse means. It means live knowing that your marriage can't and won't last forever. Most likely, one, will, one of you will outlive the other. Live in light of that day. In other words, marriage is a temporary blessing at best. The same goes for child rearing. I mean, how many couples have you known who divorced once the last kid left the home because they built their lives around something that wouldn't last so their marriage tanks when the kids were gone. When it comes to family relationships, listen to Jesus talking about his own mother and brothers who asked to see him. Jesus said this, Who is my mother and who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Jesus is turning our thinking upside down. Of course, he loved his mom and he loved his brothers, but he's also making clear that our natural relationships are temporary at best. So he says this to remind us that we've been ushered into a new sense of family. And unlike our earthly families, this new spiritual family will last forever. When you finally understand this, you'll get what Paul is saying in 1 Corinthians. He said, an unmarried man can spend his time doing the Lord's work and thinking how to please him. But a married man can't do that so well. He has to think about his earthly responsibilities and how to please his wife. Paul said, once a person marries, you have to deal with divided loyalties. It's just a fact. You can't and neither should you neglect your marriage, even for a good thing like the work of God. But notice how Paul categorized it. He called it our earthly responsibility. Now, don't get me wrong. Marriage is a great thing. I, I love being married. I can't imagine doing life without Brenda. But the reason it falls into the category of an earthly responsibility is because just like possessions, marriage is for this life only. When you die, you don't hitch a U-Haul to your casket to take your stuff with you, and you don't get to take your marriage into the afterlife either. Paul reminds us that singles don't have to deal with those divided loyalties. They only have to concern themselves with what pleases the Lord. I mean, consider this. If Paul had been married during his missionary journeys, his sufferings would have been compounded by worrying about his wife and his kids at home while he was being beaten and stoned and thrown in prison and facing execution. Or how might his long absences have affected his kids and his marriage? Better yet, if you want to know whether or not ministry is hard on a marriage or a family, go ask my wife. I guess if I were to try to summarize it all, everything that I've said, I'm saying in the church, we've really gotten this backwards. We exalt marriage and family as the greatest thing in the world when the Bible treats it as secondary at best. And it's secondary not because it's unimportant. I'm not saying that at all, though I'm sure someone is going to twist my words into saying that. I'm merely reiterating what the Bible says, that marriage and family are temporary for this life only. What matters most in the kingdom of God is what outlasts this life. In this way, singles hold a distinct advantage. They're not denied children because as they lead others into a relationship with Jesus Christ, they become mothers and fathers of the eternal kind. Listen to Jesus in Matthew 19, 12. There are eunuchs who've been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men. And there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who's able to receive this, receive it.
Jesus says there's three types of eunuchs, those that are born that way with the inability to produce children, those who've been made that way by men, like I mentioned earlier, who were forced to undergo castration, and third, those who voluntarily choose a life of celibacy. In other words, some of Christ's followers willingly renounce marriage and sexual activity for the sake of serving Christ's kingdom. Then Jesus adds this, let him who's able to receive this, receive it. In other words, if you can do this, it's a very good thing. This is what Paul chose for himself and what he encouraged others to consider. He said to the unmarried and the widows, I th- say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord, but the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. I say this to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. So maybe now you better understand what God means when he promises those who remain single in Christ will receive blessings that are better than the blessings of marriage and children, which leads me to this last point. One is a whole number. And let me begin by saying serve Christ with single devotion. I mean, Jesus is saying to us, if you're single, don't waste it. Live your life to the full for the kingdom of God. Make the most of every day and every opportunity for Christ. Remind those of us who are married that the kingdom of God is more important than marriage and children and houses and lands. In other words, see singleness as an opportunity to take advantage of, not a condition to escape from. Don't view being single as a problem to be solved, but as a potential to be unleashed. Singleness is an opportunity to grow and to heal and to invest your life in things that it would be difficult to do if you had the commitment of spouse and kids. Singleness is a time to learn about intimacy with God. Ultimately, neither marriage nor children can give final meaning to anyone's life. If you want the truth in a, in a nutshell, here it is. Hold lightly to what you value greatly because you can't keep it forever anyway. Once again, Hear what one of the most prominent singles in the early church wrote to us all about living in this day and time. He wrote, don't be wishing you were someplace else or with someone else. Where you are right now is God's place for you. Live and obey and love and believe right there. God, not your marital status, defines your life. You know, sometimes singles become obsessed with finding a mate. And sometimes marrieds get obsessed with believing they found the wrong mate. This has causes both of them to go on this never-ending search to find the elusive it that will fill up their life. Whether you're married or whether you're single, let me tell you, no human being can fill up your life and make you whole. Don't put that on your husband. Don't put that on your wife. Don't put that on your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your best friend. All relationships leave us thirsty because only one relationship can quench the thirst, and that's the one we have with God. Sooner or later, we have to acknowledge nothing on this earth, not possessions, not people, not marriage, is going to fill the void we feel. Nothing is going to satisfy that emptiness except for God. As singles, you can't just continue to live with the illusion that someone or something is going to make you feel whole. We need to face the lies that we tell ourselves. God may very well change your circumstances in six months from now or even a year from now. But before you can move on, you have to accept reality. Reality is my worth is not defined by whether or not I'm married. Reality is every minute that goes by, I'm trading my life for something, married or single. Life is moving on, and it is a finite amount of time that I have. Reality is, and married or single, listen to this, marriage is not God's reward, and singleness is not God's punishment. The world constantly tells us in subtle and not so subtle ways that marriage is normal and singleness is abnormal, that there must be something wrong with you if you're single. But God doesn't see it that way. Instead, the Bible declares that God himself is my completer. Like it says in Colossians, you are complete in him. I think it's time for married folks to stop looking down on single folks as if there were something weird and unlovable or unspiritual about them. Truth is, they're about as weird, unlovable, and unspiritual as you are. Something else I'd like to remind you of is this. We must all learn to see seeing singleness as a gift. Listen to this from 1 Corinthians 7. God gives the gift of the single life to some, the gift of the married life to others. Singleness is not a curse. According to the Bible, it's a gift. 
And I know some of you might be thinking, if singleness is a gift, what's the return policy? But it is a gift. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's a permanent gift. Being single or being married is not a permanent gift. I mean, think about it. Even if you're given the gift of marriage, it's not an eternal gift. You have it for right now, for this life, but you're not going to have it forever. In the same way, just because someone's single now doesn't mean that they're always going to be so. The, but the Bible declares it is a gift right now. Also, I have to tell you, just because it's a gift doesn't mean you're never going to struggle with it. Singles should expect struggles. Married people should expect struggles. But having the gift of marriage or the gift of singleness does mean that God will give you his grace to handle the challenges of either. Singleness doesn't mean that God has forgotten you or abandoned you or doesn't care about your needs. It may mean that he has an adventure for you so big that domestic life can't contain it. Listen to Paige Benton Brown explain it. This is good. She said, I'm not single because I'm too spiritually unstable to deserve a husband or too spiritually mature to need one. I'm single because God is good and this is his best for me. Singleness is your gift if you're single. Marriage is your gift if you're married. This is what God has given you in this stage of life because God is all about your good and your growth. In other words, my circumstances are God's gracious gift to me, and I'm to learn to accept them from his hand as such. How about this from Preston Sprinkle? He said, the good news about a single Savior who provides abundant life for all who die with him, Jesus didn't view his celibacy as a no, a no to joy, a no to sex, a no to intimacy, but rather he viewed it as a life-giving yes. Yes to relationship, yes to friends, yes to serving others, and yes to enjoying life to the fullest. God gives to some people the good gift of marriage, and he gives to others the good gift of singleness. Von Roberts wrote this, We should receive our situation in life, whether it is singleness or marriage, as a gift of God's grace to us. By the way, you don't need to feel guilty or rebellious if you desire marriage, provided you don't begrudge the gift that God has currently given to you. All marriage really is, is an undeserved gift from God. If you're married, it's not because you managed to get your life all together well enough so that God could finally bless you with marriage. No, it's not even remotely true. I've known too many married people to believe that. It's a gift. It's a gift he decided to give you because he wants to continue his work of conforming you to his image. And he chose marriage as the means to do that. If you're single, it's not because you haven't done enough to deserve marriage. No, it's just that he wants to continue his work of conforming you to his image. And he chose singleness as his means of doing that. I know times have changed considerably since my single days back in college. I won't pretend for a minute to understand all the challenges that singles are facing today. I mean, just the fact that a full third of all relationships in this generation begin online is a whole new world. We didn't even have the internet back when I was dating. Back in my day, Google was called an encyclopedia. It's a brave new world. It wasn't that long ago that I just learned what sliding into your DMs is supposed to mean. There's a whole digital vocabulary I don't even understand. Of course, I'm not quite as bad as the woman who put LOL on her friend's Facebook status describing how her son was deathly ill because she thought it meant lots of love. But some things never change, do they? Like I know what it's like to feel an incredible emptiness in my soul and mistakenly think that finding the right person would fill it up and make it go away. Because I did that. I put my hunger for healing and completeness and wholeness onto Brenda, which only set up our marriage to fail. I was needy. She was needy. Neither of us was capable of meeting the need in the other because we were giving out of a deficit. It was only after we healed, learned to lean on God as our completer, and learned to love each other as we are and for who we are, that our marriage became great. What I'm saying is all of us desperately are hungry to be whole. All of us possess a soul hunger that no human being can fill. So whether you're single or whether you're married, you have to find the kind of soul satisfaction and deep down healing that you need in God. This applies to marrieds and singles alike. The final principle I'll share is this, contentment isn't found in the right circumstances. Friends, you can mark it down. Real happiness is an internal quality. So much so that I can tell you flat out, if you're single and unhappy, you'll be married and twice as unhappy. If you're married and discontent, 
you'll be divorced and discontent. We spend so much effort trying to manipulate life in order to arrive at perfect circumstances. We think I'll be happy if I can get all the externals right. I can tell you right now, you're looking in the wrong place for contentment because contentment isn't found in the right circumstances. Listen to how Paul said it. I've learned by now to be quite content whatever my circumstances. I'm just as happy with little as with much, with much as with little. I found the recipe for being happy, whether full or hungry, hands full or hands empty. Whatever I have, wherever I am, I can make it through anything in the one who makes me who I am. I think we could easily add to his little list there, married or unmarried, because Paul is saying that contentment comes from knowing that Christ is with you in all situations. It comes from knowing that he always has my best interests at heart. Paige Benton Brown said it so well. She said, can God be any less good to me on the average Tuesday morning than he was on that monumental Friday afternoon when he hung on a cross in my place? The answer is a resounding no. I know that some of you are positive that you'd be happier if you were married. But just as many married people woke up this morning convinced that they'd be happier if they were single. Unless and until you can be content with who you are and what you have in this moment, nobody's going to fill up your unhappiness. And remember this, if marriage was the answer, then we wouldn't have over 50% divorce rate, would we? If you're not content in life, it's not even time to think about marriage. Marriage is about two healthy people, contented people coming together and the two becoming one. If you're not healthy or whole people, you don't have two becoming one. You have half of a person marrying another half of a person in hopes of finding wholeness. Remember that one half times one half equals one fourth. You'll end up worse off than when you started. By the way, in just a couple of weeks, I am going to be doing this three-part series on unfinished business, which is all about facing our unresolved past and finding healing that God wants us to have. So please stay tuned for that. It's so important as a follow-up to this message. This is the great paradox of marriage. To not need marriage means you have a far greater chance of getting married. Here's something I want you to keep in mind. If you're not forming meaningful friendships with other people right now in your single life, you're hosed when it comes to marriage because that's all marriage is. It's a deep abiding friendship. The skills you need for marriage are honed in your deep friendships with other people. So you need other singles in your life but you need married people in your life too. You need friends of all kinds. Let me tell you something from the heart. The vast majority of your needs don't have anything to do with being single. You need prayer. You need to serve others. You need to be held accountable for your life and decisions. And so do married people. Terry Hershey made a, an excellent point. He said churches should never be divided along gender or marital or generational lines. As soon as we ghettoize people, Oh, I'm glad you're in our church today. Oh, you're single? Then go to room 207. Then we've done something wrong. The mistake we made 25 years ago when churches were first getting into singles ministry was to assume that every church had to have a singles minister and a singles program. Now, don't mishear what I'm saying. I, I don't see anything wrong with singles getting together or having groups. That's not a problem near as much as when that's the exclusive means of fellowship and connection we have. Let me also add, in the same way that single people need married people, married people need single people. Think about this one simple, indisputable fact. In the church, when it comes to marriage, the vast majority of what we know, teach, and practice comes from two single men, Jesus and the Apostle Paul. Married people need single people in their life too. Bottom line, you are a relationship creature, and nothing good comes from living your life in isolation from others. Everything good and meaningful that comes into your life will come in it through the doorway of relationship. That's why my community group was just as instrumental in the healing of my marriage as therapy was. Because my community group kept me from putting the burden for, of all of my emotional needs on my wife. Others were contributing to my need for acceptance and validation and love and honesty and presence and truth. So rather than encouraging men and women either toward marriage or toward singleness, instead of constantly trying to set up all your single friends, what we ought to be concerned about is encouraging all our brothers and sisters in Christ, whether married or single, toward deepening their walk with Christ, seeking his kingdom, 
following his will, regardless of where it leads. We should be encouraging all believers to do life in the company of others because we all need life-giving transformational relationships. That's kingdom living, not living in isolation from others, but being connected, grounded, and loving others. Because scripture promises, if we learn to seek God's kingdom first, he'll add everything to our life that we truly need. We all need more of him. Oh, may he have more of us. Let's pray. Father, I just want to thank you for this time that we've had in your word. I want to thank you, God, for the powerful reminders in Old and New Testament about how singleness is a status that is not a consolation prize. It's not a status that's looked down upon at all. Instead, because of how the family of God is now formed, singleness is an elevated standard. And so, God, I pray that every single who is listening to me now would hear that as the affirmation that it truly is, that you promise us, God, to all of them, a name that would last forever and blessings even greater than marriage. So, God, for our singles, may we listen to them and learn from them and lean into their understanding of what it means to follow Christ with pure devotion. God, I thank you for the singles we have modeled in the Old and New Testament who teach us so much about what it means means to do life with you. God, I pray that you would have your way in our life. I pray that we would begin to understand the really big picture that really, whether we're married or whether we're single, it is your gift to us right now. And that we're to find contentment in that gift. And as we find contentment in that gift, and as we connect meaningfully to other people, God, then we're in this place that no matter what the future may hold, we're prepared for that future. We're ready to step into it boldly in your name. I pray, Father, that you will continue to remake Spring Creek into a church that looks more and more like what you intended it to be. God, use our lives. Draw us closer to you. Help us to realize, God, that the most important thing for all of us to be doing, whether we're married or single, is not just encouraging one another in our walk with God, but encouraging those outside the faith to come to know Jesus Christ, to be a part of the family through the new birth, because God, you have made possible for this world to be reconciled to you. We don't have to be born into the Jewish faith. We don't have to be born as a son or daughter of Abraham. We're born again when we trust in what Jesus accomplished on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. When we do that, we become Become the children of God. So God, I pray if there's anyone who's listening to me right now who doesn't know you in a personal relationship, that they would just reach out with a hand of faith and say, Jesus, I want you in my life. I didn't understand that till just now that God, you came and you made a way for me to be reconciled to God. You died on the cross to pay for my sins. You rose again to prove that you're a living savior and that you're alive and well and can work in my life right now. So God, do that. Do in through and for me what I can't do for myself. Save me, make me a new creation, help me to understand it more. In Jesus' name, amen. Anytime that you join us, anytime that you make any kind of decision, we'd love to hear about it. Whether that decision is to trust Christ for the very first time, you're renewing a commitment to Christ, or maybe it is that you've decided, hey, I want to be a part of a small group. I don't want to live in isolation anymore, or I need prayer about this matter. Please, you can let us know. Uh, You can put anything in the comments below. A pastor will respond to that. You can join us on the Circle app, which is a place where we can chat as a family of God. You can ask questions there. We would love to know more about what's going on in your life. Thanks for joining us this week. Join us again next week. There's going to be another outstanding message from uh, Pastor Jessica. Really looking forward to that. I know you are too. God bless you. Have a great week.